All right. Well, thank you all for for being here. It's a it's a pleasure to give uh, uh, one one part of these uh, one part of these lectures. Uh, just before I start, these you know these these lectures are for you. It's actually I want to see if I can take advantage of just a smaller group to really encourage you as much as possible to just ask questions. We can kind of go off on tangents, kind of the kind of stuff that you're that you're interested in. You know, you've all take kind of come from different backgrounds, maybe seen some things, not seen other things. So really do just kind of stop me. We can kind of just have a conversation about the the models that, are, that I'm going to cover. Uh, which for kind of the two sets of lectures are going to be focused on dynamics and innovation. And in, in, in the first lectures, it's really going to be based on taking a monopolistic competition model and kind of putting in dynamics and an innovation decision. Uh, and then in the second one, it's going to be more taking the perspective. So that, that's really kind of starting from like the basic trade models and kind of adding innovation and dynamics. And then the other one is going to be more starting from the growth literature, the growth and innovation literature, uh, and kind of showing how you can think of the, of, about that also in an open uh, in an open economy setting. And that that'll be uh, that'll be this afternoon's uh, 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 that'll be this afternoon's lecture. Um, so let me start now with the with the monopolistic competition one. Uh, so I'm, I've assumed I saw that actually Elhanan even in his uh, in the, the first lectures you had kind of covered the the basic kind of static model with uh, with CS preferences kind of which have a lot of convenience about kind of markups being uh, markups being exogenous. Um, the just this idea that that profits are going to be proportional to there's going to be one indicator of firm performance and then kind of variable profits and sales are always going to be proportional to that uh, to that measure. And so that that's going to give us a lot of simplifications. Uh, and I'm going to kind of rely on that in um, in this first set of lectures, then kind of when it comes to the afternoon lecture and then for the rest of John Marco's lecture, you know, then we'll talk about, well, you know, there's a lot of evidence that uh, markups respond, and mark, mark, in particular, markup responds to trade and to competition, and then kind of show you uh, uh, show show you modeling extensions that uh, that incorporate that. Okay. Oh, and if there's anything that's unclear, so I I tried to kind of put in my head all kind of the stuff that so the the part of my. Uh, uh, my PhD lecture notes where kind of I assume that I kind of covered some things in the past. So I'll try to make sure to point out wherever that comes up, but I might forget. So please, again, do kind of let me know if there's kind of some notation that you're not sure what what it means. Uh, uh, do let me know. It's not you that's kind of not understanding something. It's me that hasn't kind of properly explained a, a key concept. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to do, even just before going on to the dynamics, is say, okay, well, how can we think about just innovation within kind of the static framework, right? Um, one, one of the advantages uh, of the monopolistic competition model. So, for example, relative to to the uh, Eden Quarter model that uh, that that you've uh, studied, that the Eden Quarter one captures kind of one very important part. Of competition about this kind of head-to-head -head competition for producing a variety, right? That in the open economy, there's just going to be one producer who's going to win out and serve one particular market. And kind of the monopolistic competition one kind of doesn't have that feature. Kind of the varieties are going to be sold everywhere, kind of subject to kind of a selection decision uh, uh, by the firms. Uh, one advantage of that is you can keep adding on different decisions that the firms make, right? So in the closed economy we want, it can just be about, do I want to produce or do I want to exit? We saw that in an open economy, you can then add the decision about, do you want to export? Uh, but then it can be, what countries do you want to export to? Uh, yeah, Elhanan talked about that. I thought in his notes about, you know, do I want to become a multinational? And then kind of Paul also added some additional decisions. And so the, in this framework, I can show you kind of that there's 
a basic way of thinking about innovation that, that follows in a very similar way. Okay, so the easiest one is if you wanted to think about just a, a, a binary decision about there's a new technology out there. Okay, do I want to adopt that technology or not? So kind of in this example, and this is taken from a paper by, uh, by Bustos, who then kind of used this to take this to the data. She was looking at Argentinian firms and whether kind of the trade opening uh, from uh, the Mercosur trade agreement, kind of what, how that induced new exporters to adopt new technologies. Okay, so in the simplest framework, some, uh, you know, so my, I'm gonna keep this notation where this bar phi is going to be the firm's productivity, okay? Um, and you can think about adopting the new technology. It's just going to bump up that productivity by some factor, factor iota that's greater than one. And then you pay a fixed cost to upgrade to the new technology. Okay. So right away, you should recognize kind of this trade-off between fixed and variable cost that you've seen in tons of uh, these other decisions related to trade, right? The decision to export, uh, the decision to become a multinational, the decision to... Um, uh, work with a foreign supplier, right? They all have this feature of trading off uh, fixed costs versus variable returns, right? Here's the variable returns and uh, uh, here's a fixed cost, right? So you have this model right away, you're gonna just induce this selection pattern. You're gonna have that the more productive firms are gonna adopt a new technology, right? And then you can superimpose that on a model of trade, right? Where they have the same kind of selection forces Think of this as this is a cutoff where you want to export. Um, depending on these parameter choices, right, you can get the cutoff for adopting the new technology to be below or to be above the cutoff for export. The main point I want to make is you already are going to deliver something that you see very, very strongly in uh, the data, uh, which is that uh, new exporters uh, invest in these new technologies. Right, um, and that's something that kind of Paula highlighted in in her paper. Uh, you know, the important thing, you know, for her empirical work was also kind of the exogeneity of it, right? So, kind of once we go to the dynamic models, you should be there are two possible stories, right? Which is, I'm a firm, I innovate, or or just I come across, I stumble across a new technology, um, and that new technology makes it profitable for me to to sell to more markets, right? as well as the reverse one, which is, oh, well, new markets are opening up, right? And that's going to give me then causation running in the other direction. That gives me an incentive to, uh, to innovate more. And kind of, we'll see both of those. Yeah, Eric. Your, your assumption here is that the innovation acts multiplicatively on your, on your productivity. Yes. Uh, that's not the only conceivable assumption. It could be additive, in which case uh, it would no longer be true that the more productive firms uh, are necessarily the ones, the only ones innovating. Is, is the reason for doing it multiplicatively to fit some so, so, facts about so that definitely so that, that, that there's a very strong correlation with kind of both the level and kind of the innovation. So both in terms of the level of productivity of the firms kind of being um, also those that, that participate in export market, as well as the ones that keep innovating. So once you put it into, for example, a dynamic model, those that kind of keep innovating. So some of that is yes for um, uh, uh, to, to kind of fit that, that data. Um, and I should point out that it's, there's going to be a lot of proportionality. I haven't talked about preferences, but in CS where the shock, so ultimately what we really care about is not necessarily productivity, right? It's what happens to your overall operating profits, right? Because that's, what's going to matter. And so what Eric is saying, well, maybe, you know, if it didn't have this functional form, then maybe, all the firm's profits would not move up proportionately, right? And one reason could be because of this technology. Another reason, and this is kind of what we'll, we'll be talking about later uh, today, though not as much in the context of innovation, is it could be because of competition too. So even if I had this functional form, 
in a model of oligopoly or in even simpler monopolistic competition with non-CS preferences, then also we kind of recover this feature, right? Where um, you're, you're not always going to get the same proportional effect, right? And then similarly, as you were saying, Eric, then you can kind of get a prediction that maybe the highest incentive to innovate is somewhere else in the distribution. And so these models can kind of accommodate that. These functional forms are one kind of used for simplicity, kind of the proportional one kind of is, is simpler to, to aggregate, but also because it doesn't violate kind of some of the basic things we see empirically, which is kind of the um, innovation being very strongly related to, um, uh, to, uh, to performance and especially to uh, new activities by the firm, like entering into the export market. So I kind of show you that in, in a dynamic model, actually this part of it is gonna be very important because we're gonna to want uh, to ge uh, also generate another empirical regularity about Gibraltar's law that kind of if one set of firms keeps growing faster and faster because they innovate more, then um, you're not going to get some kind of stable kind of distribution of firms or one set of firms is just going to keep growing and separate out from uh, separate out from the rest. Um, so here's one form and this is just with a binary choice and actually we'll um, I'll talk about kind of um, how this is a one kind of that I'm, I'll use kind of when I go to a, to a dynamic version, uh, which is now let's think about a continuous innovation decision. Okay. So if you thought about the a pure extension of the other one, you can think. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, okay. Didn't like, uh, didn't like my next slide. Um, <laughs> Uh, so here, uh, the, the simplest way of extending the previous one would, to, would be to say, well, maybe there's not just a single choice, a fixed cost and uh, that variable iota return. Maybe the firms have a menu of those, right? I pay a higher fixed cost, I get a higher... Um, the battery. Um, maybe you could use the standing mic. Oh, I'll use this. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, I'm going to touch to uh, replace the battery. Okay. Um, th so that would be that would be one option, right? To kind of use this menu. Uh, that turns out to be quite quite messy, actually. In, in the first. Uh, uh, dynamics and innovation paper I wrote, I kind of adopted that and uh, I quickly discovered why this kind of this method works, uh, works a lot better, which is kind of what what you see on here. So to keep the reward to be this kind of proportional bump, which again, with CS preferences is going to mean proportional bump to firm size, proportional bump to operating profits. Which is going to be uh, which is going to be very useful, and uh, it ends up being very tractable to put like this intensity of innovation in a stochastic formulation where kind of the innovation effort is geared towards getting you a higher probability of that innovation, getting that iota iota bump or not. Okay, so there's this probability alpha that innovation is successful. Um, and the, my innovation effort is all going to be at getting a higher alpha, a higher probability that's, a, that's going to be successful. And along with that, then I can specify as a cost to this uh, convex innovation cost. It's going to tell me just how expensive it is to increase my alpha. Okay. And this formulation is going to be uh, when you want kind of the, a continuous innovation choice by the firms and ends up being very trackable and almost universally now in the literature is, uh, uh, is the one that is uh, adopted. So when I first came across that, I thought, because I was also thinking about empirically kind of 
you know, you look at firm level data, you see investment rates, you see kind of how firms grow. And I thought it was a little bit strange that still in this world, all the firms, when their innovation is successful, they get the same proportional bump in their productivity. Um, but then I realized that kind of when you put this in a dynamic framework, right, there's nothing that specifies the unit of time where these decisions are, make, are made, right? And so once you kind of accumulate this over many periods of time, and that's kind of one of the goals of writing it in this way, right? Then what you get is you get a smooth kind of response in growth rates uh, across a different set of firms, right? So you can think about uh, successful firms as having many successful draws where innovation was positive, so their productivity goes up without iota to some kind of power, which is going to be, and that power is going to be different for different types of firms, depending on how many successful draws they had. And that kind of smooths out that kind of uh, profit and size increase you get from uh, over a given period of time. And so that's, that's how I think we should think of it. Um, this is going to mean that in this, uh, uh, formulation. So this is the intensity for alpha. Now we're going to also scale up the cost by the size of the firm. So this variable phi, I've transformed this one, right? Remember that this is a transformation that means that sales and operating profits are proportional to my, uh, this is bar phi, I'll just call this phi, right? And I'm going to scale up the innovation cost uh, by uh, uh, by the size of uh, uh, by the size of the firm, and the reason to do that, right? Again, it, it is for this kind of empirical property that if we don't scale it up, right? Once we embed this in a dynamic framework to so think about it without the scale up, right? Then the bigger firms are going to have an incentive to because there's this uh, trade-off between fixed and variable costs. The bigger firms are going to innovate more, right? They keep on innovating more. They're going to keep growing at a disproportionately high rate, right? So once you kind of scale this up in this way, and I'll show you kind of the, the first order condition, you get that the big firms choose the same innovation rate, and that's going to generate um, uh, uh, Gibraltar's law, okay? For the big firms, and then on top of that, you can get some really kind of interesting things, both about the growth rate of the really small firms, that then they tend to grow at a faster rate. And again, this is something that also has strong empirical support as well. And I'll show you that in the dynamic version as the firms that are right around the export cutoff, that those new exporters uh, grow uh, disproportionately fast and innovate uh, disproportionately more. And that can all be kind of captured by this um, by this framework. Is, yeah. Is it possible to measure something like innovation cost directly to, to see whether your model's assumption um, is borne out, or, or is that is that part of the whole? Thing? So innovation cost. I mean, it's 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 in per, it's imperfect, right? So it's measures of, for example. Um, we, you, typically, we don't have that for all firms. So typically, these are surveys that you can ask firms about uh, R and D expenditures, R and D uh, R and D workers. You know, you can classify some types of investment as kind of R and D investments, but you know, there it, it gets to be it's hard to kind of draw the line uh, uh, between uh, between those. Um, so you, so well, that's one part of the literature. The other part of the literature is looking at the outcome of an innovation. So, for example, for pat, you know, for for patents, um, what you you find in um, so in terms of kind of growth rates, there's a lot of evidence for Gibraltar's law. But exactly what outcome is kind of delivering that, and is it because innovation is roughly constant? Is um, that's something that's harder. There's no kind of glaring relationship in terms of kind of between firm size and kind of those. In, even if you looked at the innovation measures instead of the instead of the growth rates, although it's going to be much much noisier. Um, one thing that does come up very clearly, though, for example, is when it when you look at it right around things like uh, entering 
the export market. And that's one thing that these these, these models are going to be able to capture. Is it literally Chevron's law? Uh, law, it just says that in the firm size, uh, it, the, the growth rates are, are, are going to be um, uh, the all the firms, regardless of their size, are going to grow at the same rates. All the firms, regardless of their size, are going to grow at the same rate. Yes, on 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 average, I mean, on on average, meaning there's no correlation between not, not not that they have to they all grow at exactly the same rate, but just saying on average, there's no relationship between firm size and growth rates. And, and there's uh, empirical evidence for that. Yeah, well, that that's kind of what gives you basically a steady just this ergodic distribution of firm size, right? That there's no that there's there's no um, Right, right. Other, uh, otherwise, you, you wouldn't have this kind of stable, you wouldn't have this stable distribution. And again, with kind of specific violations, like, for example, for small and for young firms, for example, that doesn't, that doesn't hold. Um, so let me kind of show you just first in, in the static framework, and then we'll, we'll put it in, in the dynamic framework, kind of why we kind of get these properties and it kind of highlights a little bit why um, this, this kind of uh, formulation is one that's particularly easy to, uh, to work with. So, so think about the expected profits of this firm with this productivity fee that I've just um, rescaled, right? So that now profits are proportional to fee. Um, so in expectation, the firm with probability alpha gets the productivity bump with one minus alpha, it doesn't. Um, B is that CS level of market demand, right? So uh, that's what's keeping everything proportionate here. It means that in a proportion of 10% shock here, it's going to increase my operating profits by 10%, keeping market demand fixed. Okay. So here's the on, on, on the profit side, I have to pay for my fixed cost of innovation and it may have some overhead fixed cost. All right. And then just the first order condition, right? It's just going to give me the level of innovation as determined by the innovation step and the level of market demand, right? So right away, I, I get this property um, that uh, tells me that the firms are gonna have the, the same innovation rate, right? Not quite though, right? Because I put here, so you could think of it as, you know, this is for like the set of, uh, for exporting firms where B, is the market demand for domestic plus export markets, or it could be just for domestic firms. But it's not exactly going to be true for all firms, right? That's why I said we'd produce even if innovation were successful, right? So this is going to be the, uh, this is going to be the first order equation for a firm for which the innovation decision is not going to interact with the decision e either to survive, right? So that's why kind of small firms are going to have different growth rates because now if you innovate, it's not just that you get these higher profits. It could also be the difference between uh, surviving and then exiting and kind of giving up with your, your on your, for example, sunk cost of entry. All right, and same thing when it comes to export market entry. Right, if your innovation decision is tied to whether you're going to be able to break into the export market it's going to give you an extra incentive to innovate. And I'll kind of show you that in the, the simulations of this in a, in a dynamic version. But for the really big firms, the ones that are going to export no matter what, whether innovation is successful or not, they're going to have the same innovation rate here. And this is kind of going to deliver in the dynamic version of the model, that kind of steady state uh, distribution over, um, over productivity. The other thing that it gives us right away is if we think of the innovation rate for exporters and non-exporters, we see right away that they're going to be different, right? Because what's going to determine the rate of innovation is going to be the level of market demand. So if I'm thinking of a firm that doesn't export, then B is just a market demand for my domestic market, right? Um, if I'm thinking about a firm that's exporting, if it's a symmetric world with no trade cost, then B would be doubled, right? If it's, a, if it's a world that's not symmetric with trade costs, then B is gonna be higher for exporters, but not, not, necessarily, uh, not necessarily double. 
Okay, so that's just kind of in the, in the static framework. Now I kind of want to introduce dynamics. And before I do kind of the full dynamics, so what I'm going to get to is I'm going to go to dynamics with this innovation decision. Okay, and kind of show you transitions, what happens when um, trade is liberalized, when firms can uh, innovate with this framework. Okay, I want to kind of just back up and say, well, okay, now if we want to think about these dynamic, putting those monopolistic competition models with dynamics, um, what are kind of some intermediate steps that we could go along the way before we get to this full blown model? Okay, so um, just first thing, this is just kind of just some note keeping, which is, you know, you, you, you've, um, uh, as you've seen, kind of the kind of the basic selection equations in the monopolistic competition models that tell us, you know, firms, there's going to be this cutoff profit equation where only a certain set of firms are going to produce, right? And then there's the free entry condition that's going to say, you know, on average, the profit that I make, even considering the entrants who enter and don't produce, is going to have to uh, reimburse me for my entry cost, right? Once you go into a dynamic framework, you have those same equilibrium conditions. They're just going to be based on the value function of the firm. Right. So the cutoff uh, condition about whether you keep producing or you don't produce is going to be based on your value being positive. Right. And the pre entry condition is just going to be that the value, so kind of the net present value of all your kind of future profit flows, is going to have to reimburse you for the entry cost, uh, which is uh, uh, potentially, um, uh, which is potentially sunk. Okay, uh, but otherwise, kind of the equations look very much the same. I guess the one thing that's potentially different in a dynamic model is in a static model, right? We just always assume that this kind of the way I've defined it here, kind of I call this like the net value of entry, right? That it's always equal to zero in um, a static model, which gives us kind of a positive amount of entry. In a dynamic framework, um, and this is important, uh, especially important kind of when you have uh, some big trade shocks, it's also poss possible for the net value of entry to be negative, right? And entry to be zero, okay? I think actually this part of it is something that's often neglected in a lot of models that look at effects of kind of trade shocks. And in fact, all the trade shocks that I'll show you are kind of designed to ensure that this condition always holds. But I feel like empirically, we see a lot of cases where we end up in this situation here, where the shock is big, big enough that essentially entry goes to zero, right? So, I mean, you can think of a whole bunch of industries and these are not small industries, right? Um, I can't remember exactly the last time a steel producing plant was built in the United States, which still produces steel. Um, it was a very long, uh, it, it was a very long time ago. Um, and same thing in, in a lot of other kind of uh, important sectors. So I think that this is not something to be neglected, especially since when I get to the, you know, the dynamic versions, I'll show you that um, when you open up to trade, there's going to be a very strong force that's going to push entry down, okay? And thinking about cases where entry is driven all the way to zero certainly seems to me, in, in, empirically at least, to be something that's, uh, that's realistic. Okay, so different ways of kind of putting in the, the dynamics. The simplest one is really not doing much at all. Actually, it's the one that I adopted when uh, uh, I wrote my, uh, my job market paper, my 2003 econometrica paper, where I wanted to put in dynamics without a lot of the cost of kind of the computational models that I'll, that I'll show you later. So it's just basically a way of saying, well, you know, kind of there's dynamics. I can talk about the, uh, uh, the um, uh, entry and the export cost as being sunk, but there's nothing really that's, uh, nothing is really kind of changing over time except for this probability that the, of exit, which is going to in, induce kind of some discounting. You can also put in kind of some time discounting. So essentially here, <clears throat> value functions are just kind of a multiplier of your profit in every period. So firms make the same decision in every period. Um, it doesn't really kind of change much from the static model. The only thing that I thought it was useful for me to explain 
is kind of in the static model, you don't have any real way of thinking about, well, how do I transition from like one equilibrium to the other? So let's say you open up the trade or kind of something else kind of happens with trade. And let's say kind of the uh, number of firms is, is changing, you know, it can go up, it can go down. How are you going to transition over time to the new equilibrium? Well, at least kind of this gives you a way of thinking about that, uh, that transition path. And in particular, kind of highlighting that the, the transition paths are going to be asymmetric, depending on whether the response of entry is going to be positive or negative, right? If it's positive, a whole bunch of firms can enter right away, right? And you can move right to the new equilibrium. If there's a negative shock where entry is going to go down, um, this is going to say that the firms are going to slowly, uh, the number of firms is going to slowly go down as they get hit with, uh, as they get hit with a death, uh, uh, with a death shock. Not, uh, so anyway, so what a very simple, but not particularly illuminating way of building in dynamics. Uh, a second one, which I think is, um, uh, does much more, and this is, can be particularly helpful when you're thinking about embedding this into kind of the standard dynamic, the SGE uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium macro models, okay? And so for that, you'd still want a lot of uh, uh, tractability. So you wanna get uh, rid of essentially any option values that are kind of come to the firm. I'm gonna talk about option values in a second. Okay, um, and the way to, to do that is to have get rid of endogenous exits for the firm, so that overhead fixed cost. So essentially, once the firm enters, okay, um, it is there's going to be no option value associated with that. That that firm is kind of going to stay there until it gets um, uh, it gets hit with, for example, you can still have the death shock, and still it gets it gets hit with the death shock or without the death shock. It's just always going to be there. The big advantage of this is that in this dynamic versions, all the firms can still make different decisions, in particular, different decisions about what markets, for example, do I serve? It can also be different decisions about, for example, what technology am I going to, am I going to adopt? And so in this kind of framework, you get rid of the overhead fixed cost. Um, so there's no change in the equilibrium distribution of productivity, right? But what you can embed is you can still embed all of the macroeconomic dynamics that you have from your DSG model. And then you can see how all of the individual firms are going to respond to that changing aggregate environment. Right? Um, so the, just to give you one example where I think this is uh, useful and with kind of apologies for referring to another one of my papers, but I kind of like it. It's also kind of a little bit of a pet peeve of mine about how much kind of a macroeconomics um, ignores kind of this issue that kind of over time and synced with the business cycle that there are going to be changes of this entry margin, that firms are going to enter and exit over the business cycle and kind of the total set of producers is going to change, is going to change over time. And that has a lot of important properties for thinking about uh, models of the business cycle. So for example, you know, thinking about what's happening to profits and markups over the business cycle. Well, a lot of it can be generated by the fact that there, there can be more entry in times of booms and less and more exit in, uh, in the troughs. And that's, that can have uh, important repercussions, which kind of don't happen when you always have the same set of producers, um, as well as in the international context. Yeah, Jen Marco. So it it so it doesn't it doesn't have to come out right so it doesn't have to come out um uh, so, so two questions. The one about the one of them is an empirical. The one of them is just an empirical issue. So, kind of some responses when I've said that is is kind of what what Jen Marco is saying is, oh well, look if I if I if I look at the data, if I look at the employment, um, if I look at, at at the employment by new firms or even new plants, right? It's a very small fraction of total employment. 
So does that really matter for my uh, for my macro model? So one answer that that uh, uh, that I would say is that this these kind of entry and this effect, for example, when I was talking about it over the business cycle, um, the the it, the equivalent data point, the point in the data is not necessarily a firm or even a, a plant. It's really a product. Right, so you can really think about. I'm not going to cover extensions to multi-product firms, right? But you can think about all of this as essentially happening for a particular product, right? And so again, if I go back to what's happening over the business cycle, is um, is I'm going to say, well, look, in periods of booms, there are going to be uh, incentives for many more new product uh, introductions, okay? And there, empirically. The share of kind of those new products, kind of like if you look over a period of five years, becomes a much more substantial share than just about um, uh, than just about new firms. So that that would be kind of my first type of uh, uh, my first type of answer to that. Um, so so just to give you just briefly a one one example based on a a, a paper I wrote with. Um, uh, with Fabio Gironi, which was kind of related to the international macro part of it. So in internet, so same thing in international macro models where you have kind of multi-country or two countries, the SGE models, you know, a lot of kind of what the predictions of the model is going to depend on what happens to essentially kind of the exchange rate or basically kind of the relative price between uh, a good at home and a good at foreign. So kind of the typical example is going to be if uh, there's, uh, if I have a positive productivity shock, what's going to happen to my kind of exchange rate to the relative price of my goods relative to my trading partners, right? Um, empirically, this is something hard that's measured because a lot of things are moving at the same time. You have to isolate uh, a, an exogenous kind of productivity shock to one country relative to another. To the extent that uh, the empirical literature has done it, it kind of shows that if, if anything, it leads kind of to an appreciation for uh, the home country. And yet, if you have a model where you don't have this margin where firms are making these decisions about goods, you just have a fixed set of goods that are exported, uh, that are exported everywhere, your model is going to predict the opposite, right? For the simple reason that one economy is going to be producing more of the same set of goods, right? They're going to be consumers around the world that have the same preferences. The only way they're going to accept to consume more of the home, same set of home goods relative to the same set of foreign goods, right? Is if they pay less for those home goods, right? So and that's going to induce this adjustment in the relative price, it's going to say, well, the home goods are, are going to have to become cheaper relative to uh, 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 relative to, to the foreign goods. And so they pre uh, they, they're going to predict the opposite uh, movement of these of these relative prices, uh, uh, a depreciation. Note that as soon as you allow for entry, you're going to kind of be able to reverse that prediction, right? So now you get a positive shock in one country. Well, there's another margin, which is there are going to be more goods that are going to be available in the economy that's growing, right? And now you break that relationship from the point of view of the consumer. The consumer doesn't have to pay less for the home-produced goods, right? Relative to, uh, uh, to the foreign, it can just get to consume more of those home-produced goods, right? And in fact, what happens in this version is you just recover a version of the whole market effect. That says that you can actually even predict what happens to the relative factor prices or the relative wages. So the wages are going to go up in the home economy relative to the foreign economy. The home economy is growing. And actually, that's going to predict that the prices for the home goods are going to go up that appreciation relative to the price of the foreign goods, um, which completely reverses the prediction of these international macro models because they've kind of forced kind of the economy to expand, but not change the set of goods that they're producing, right? So I think there's a lot of things in, in that literature where you can get very different answers once you allow kind of these types of macroeconomic shocks to also affect the set of goods in the economy and the set of goods that are, um, that are being traded. 
Okay, and so the, the last uh, way to introduce dynamics um, is going to be the, the one kind of essentially formalizing the, uh, the dynamic version with innovation that I showed you before, but even kind of without innovation, kind of how would that work? So you can think of uh, productivity fee uh, following. So in the case of exogenous, I'll call this exogenous innovation. It just follows a markup process. Uh, process. There's nothing that the firm does, right? I'll add what I'll call endogenous innovation, which is give the firm the ability to kind of uh, uh, innovate with a probability alpha of getting that bump. But you could also think that essentially that probability alpha is just going to be exogenous and the same for all firms, right? Which is kind of giving essentially a markup process to, uh, uh, to fee. You still have the endogenous exit. So this is what I was saying before with the value functions. Now, of course, the distribution of productivity is going to be uh, endogenous, right? Um, you can still have that exit shock. You don't need it anymore because now you can let kind of the productivity dynamics generate exit. Um, if you're taking the model to the data, it's still useful to have like this death shock because kind of when you go to the data, you see that uh, there still are, for example, some very big firms that exit in every period. Right? If you only had the endogenous exit, then it's only the firms that are driven right at their kind of survival cutoff that are exiting. Um, and so it, this says, well, disproportionately, yes, it's going to be smaller firms that exit, but there still are some big firms that exit. It's a model that take it to the data, typically still keep the death shock and they calibrate it for at the death rate of firms above a certain size threshold, okay? Um, and the other important thing, and I'll talk more about the intuition for this, is now this is the one that introduces option values associated with entry and export decisions. And it's the one that in terms of kind of analytically writing down the, the model with pencil and paper makes it much more challenging. Often it's kind of computational. Computationally, it's very simple to solve, but not as uh, simple to solve with just pencil and um, uh, with pencil and paper. One very important thing about the option values is that it re generates responses to anticipated changes in trade costs. Um, I'll kind of motivate that in, in a couple of slides. And there's a lot of evidence that, uh, that firm decisions respond to anticipated changes. Announcements, for example, about how trade is going to change in the future. Uh, what should we think of going on productivity yeah that's that's always a good that's always a, a good question when I used to have my uh, when I used to work with PCs instead of Macs my typical answer was a new version of Windows <laughs> um, uh, for at least for me that was a negative uh, uh, shock um, uh, that, that that's that's uh, um, that's a very good question. I mean, so you you can think of it in different ways. For, first, let kind of let me back out that I want to be very agnostic about what is behind this fee, right? It's a lot of things that uh, that are going on at the level of the firm. I don't want to take the stand that it's it's disembodied from any factors. It can have to do with um, the, the firm's managers or owners, it can kind of be even kind of some part luck about kind of some products being developed, having kind of very high demand. Um, I want to move away from a, a model where kind of uh, on the product side, the products are symmetric, right? And then once you move away from that, you give them different kind of qualities, then isomorphically, um, what I'm calling productivity is no different than something I put into preferences that is called quality, All right? Um, let me know if you want me to kind of write that out, right? If I wrote the preferences in a symmetric way, I could put in a quality in front of the quantity for every firm, right? And if it's multiplicative, then kind of that quality term is going to be isomorphic to kind of, so producing more of a product with one unit of labor is the same thing as producing a product that gives a higher quality in the eyes of the consumer to me. And so I think 
to me, that's also one big part of why it can go down, right? A lot of that can also be on the demand, um, can also be on the demand side. Yeah. And so I definitely don't want you to be thinking about the products on the demand side necessarily being all um, that being all symmetric. Um, we talked a little bit about the endogenous distribution, but for productivity, it's going to become especially important when we do the dynamics, and it was kind of related to Gibraltar's law, right? So, uh, in in this version here, you can stick with uh, any given distribution for entry, right? That often kind of I use G, and I think often in the slides might have used G distribution for you get a productivity draw upon entry, right? But now kind of productivity is going to move. And in the static world, all you did is you chopped it off, right? Some firms below a threshold exit it or above a threshold uh, uh, export it, but you never change that shape of the productivity. And still you see a lot of papers kind of doing that. I've written a bunch of papers doing that. A Pareto distribution is a really useful distribution to use for that because regardless of when, where you chop off a productivity distribution and you keep the upper tail, it preserves exactly the same shape, all right? Um, but here in this kind of version of the model, you're going to kind of change the shape of the distribution because of the evolution of productivity. And so you can keep that distribution G, but just know that then the distribution that you're going to end up with is going to be different. And in fact, mass is going to shift to the right, right, as some firms are going to, uh, the firms that are going to exit are the low productivity firms, which is going to shift mass out to the, to the right. So kind of if I were drawing this and I still had a Pareto distribution of productivity for entry, right? And I put in like a Markov process and I looked at the steady state distribution, um, the mass would kind of get shifted out more, pushed out to the right. Okay, um, you can uh, uh, you can still keep that distribution here. So this is typically kind of called uh, the distribution G. Um, what you can also do once you have the dynamics is this distribution ends up not being very important anymore. It's kind of crucial in the static versions, not as important in the dynamic versions where everything is generated by the uh, productivity process. Um, and so what you can do is even you can just assume that G is degenerate, right? And in fact, in the, in the computational results that I'll show you for kind of trade liberalization, the assumption is firms enter, you know, there's just a normalized productivity at entry. And then you still get a distribution of uh, productivity that is generated by uh, either an exogenous process for firm evolution or by endogenous productivity in the version that I was telling you. And it's one that's that's going to, um, uh, and that's where Chabra's law is going to end up being important to kind of give you that steady, essentially uh, ergodic distribution. And in fact, in the version that I showed you with kind of in innovation, um, it's actually going to generate uh, at least for the big firms where kind of selection is not an issue, it's going to generate a Pareto distribution for, um, uh, for those firms. Um, uh, so here, first I just kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, what happens with dynamics and option values and kind of just motivate that it's very important for, uh, that this is going to be very important for um, uh, for anticipation effects. So pardon kind of my scribbled graph. So think about uh, the net, I'm, I'm going to do this for the export market and export market selection, but it also holds for uh, staying in the domestic market and, and survival. But let me just motivate this with exports, okay? So think of a world, first think of a world where there's no uncertainty, okay? So the firm is going to care about as a function of its productivity, the net present value of its future profits, right? So not just my profits today, but you know my, my total accumulation of all my future profits, right? If there's no uncertainty, if we're in a world of no uncertainty, um, even if uh, uh, I have a sunk cost, so it doesn't matter that the sunk is, uh, cost is sunk if there's no uncertainty, right? It's the same as paying an amortized portion of that in every single period. Um, I'm going to enter the export market whenever the net present value of my future profit flows is higher than this fixed cost. 
right? And, um, and I'm going to get a single cutoff that's going to say to the right of that cutoff, I export, to the left of that cutoff, I don't export, okay? Now think about what happens now when I give you the same net present value, right? So nothing changes, but now it's going to be an expectation, right? Because now you face, the firm faces some idiosyncratic uncertainty. So notice that this firm that was just indifferent about entering the export market or not entering the export market, it's not gonna to want to enter the export market anymore, right? If I give it the same net present value, but now I'm saying, but oh, wait a minute, you're gonna take the sunk cost, which is irreversible, um, immediately that generates an option value to, to waiting, right, for the firm. And so that firm isn't going to enter. It's gonna be kind of somewhere here in the middle the firm that's going to enter is a firm for which the net present value is going to compensate it, compensate it not just for the sunk entry cost, but the option value of waiting before making that irreversible uh, uh, cost to enter the export market. Okay, and this is where the entry is going to be, and there's going to be a separate one, right, which is going to be related to uh, exiting the export market. Again, if the um, the uh, the firm here in this case, if the firm has uh, is already exporting, right? When does it exit? Well, again, it's facing this irreversible decision that once it exits, I mean, this is the assumption that it, of the model that then essentially, if it wants to re-enter, it's going to have to repay that sunk investment cost, all right? And so, a firm that has just a zero net present value of exporting is definitely in the world with uncertainty going to want to stay in. Right, because it has that option value of waiting, and maybe things are going to get better. Beef, and it's only going to exit if its net present value is not just zero, but negative, and more negative than that uh, option value of waiting. So, first thing is, it generates this what's often called a hysteresis band, right? Where in this band here, firms that are exporting are going to, in the prior period, are going to export the next period. Firms that haven't, didn't export the previous period, aren't going to enter the export market. So you see these identical firms whose export decision is based on the prior export uh, history. And there's a huge amount of empirical evidence about this type of hyster, uh, hysteresis band, right? You can, these uh, identically observable firms, the predictive power on whether you're going to export of like your previous exporting history is, uh, immensely is immensely high. So that's that's kind of one thing that you get uh, uh, from the dynamics. The other thing that you get is you get anticipation effects. And there's been some recent research showing that these anticipation effects um, are going to be um, are going to be very important. So let kind of let me mention um, let me mention two of them. One that's related to entry into the export market. So there's a lot of evidence this happened, for example, with the EU, it happens with other trade agreements where a trade agreement is announced. Nothing happens now to trade cost. And yet we see a pat and we see increased entry by firms within that new free trade area. So that kind of happened with, um, uh, 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 that happened uh, with the EU. Uh, it also happens in negative ways when kind of there are negative things happening to trade. So, for example, think about uh, Brexit that are coming up in the future, but you know about them now. You kind of also see patterns of exit ahead of actually those costs uh, uh, kicking in. So, so kind of what's going on here? When a model without any uncertainty, right, firms would just wait until the trade costs go down, say that it's a new trade agreement, before starting to export. So, say, you know, it's about the uh, it's about the EU. You're going to say, well, I know in the future I'm going to want to trade more with more of my European partners, but you know, I'm, I'm just going to wait until the costs go down, and then it's going to be worth it for me to export to those destinations. In a world where you have option values, that is no longer the case, right? So think about the firm prior to the announcement of uh, trade liberalization, right? That is just indifferent between entering or not. Okay, and now you announce and you say, well, you know, in, in a couple of years, we're going to form this trade agreement and the trade costs are going to go down, you know, which kind of, uh, um, which you can think of this as either lowering this or kind of increasing the, the export profits you're going to get. Well, what happens here, 
is right on impact, it changes the option value to the firm, right? The firm is kind of waiting to enter. It has a positive net present value of exporting, but it's not entering the export market because it kind of wants to wait and see how things shake out because once it's, it, it sinks the cost, that's irreversible. And if there's a bad shock the next period, it can't just go back and get back and recoup at some investment cost. So it's waiting. And essentially when you announce that trade is gonna be liberalized, what you're telling that firm is to say, well, you know, you're not gonna regret your decision. Right? Because for sure, like once the trade costs go down, you're definitely going to want to export. You already have a positive net present value of exporting now, so the firm is going to start exporting right upon announcement. And this is something that we see in the data. Yeah. Uh, could we imagine that the ability of the firm to make predictions about the future depends on whether or not they actually export? You mean like learning something by ex by, by yes. exporting? Yeah, so, so you can certainly kind of add, add that, you can certainly kind of add that into it, which is not in this, uh, uh, which is not in this model that when, um, you know, once you export, you kind of learn, you, you, you learn some information, you kind of have new, for example, matches where if it's kind of vertical trade with kind of uh, suppliers or, or buyers, and that can change your kind of future profitability. So that's that's another channel that that is not in here that you can have uh, either on top or on on the side of this one. But there's also kind of work about saying that you know maybe some of the that information you get kind of through the act of um, uh, uh, through the act of of exporting. Yeah, um, I mean empirically, if you're interested to, there's a very nice paper in the QGE about uh, what do exporters know and kind of showing that kind of based on where you export, you have information about kind of other similar types of markets and that kind of explains the export pattern of firms. So this is not meant to say that those things are not important. It's just kind of along a different, this is just along a different dimension. Oh, and uh, let me just make the same argument now kind of for exit. Right. So why, when you have option values now, if there's an announcement of something bad happening, um, you can see kind of exit even ahead of that, that bad thing happening, you know, same kind of argument here. Now, think, don't think about this for the export market. For example, think about this for a firm that's just surviving in the domestic industry, right? Let's say it's import competing, right? Um, it's, uh, it's sitting right here where its net present value is actually negative, right? The only reason it's staying in and it's producing is because of the possibility, there was that sunk cause, the possibility that things could get better in the future, right? That's that option value. So now you announce kind of that something bad is going to happen, say, you know, if it's in poor competing, you're going to kind of liberalize straight further, and you see the firm exit right away. Well, again, it's kind of that same argument. That firm, essentially, when you announce that you're going to say liberalize trade, you know, the firm thinks, oh, well, things aren't going to be get better for me in the future. Things are going to get worse, right? Um, I already have a negative net present value of being in here. Um, I'm getting out of here now. And again, there's kind of a lot of evidence of kind of these announcements about having uh, uh, effects well ahead of when kind of for trade. Uh, the trade agreement is, uh, is, is taking place. So you can see how for an import competing firm, it might decide to exit ahead of actually the import competition uh, showing up. Can I okay. ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Um, I just don't get it. So for the firms that are indifferent between entering or not, they're actually, so the cost of exporting is actually the, same as their profits, right? So they're indifferent. But then when the announcement appears, they decide to enter for the foreign market. But in fact, the profit is still the same as the cost. So after they- Yeah, but what the, what's changed is the option value. That's that's a point that, that, that I was making. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, so if, if, if you take the example of the firm entering the export markets, and kind of entering upon announcement, even though the trade costs haven't gone down, mm. so nothing has changed. 
what changes for the firm is the option value. That's that's the point that I was making. Yeah, I understand that. But uh, what I mean is in, in the reality, even though they're entering, they're still not making any profit before the realization of the announcement. No, no, they are. That's the that that's a point. They are right because before the, the for, there are firms that are not exporting before the announcement. There are firms that are not exporting that would actually make positive profits right away from exporting. I see because they are afraid of the, the shock. Exactly of the the irreversibility of that decision to enter. Okay. So the margin of firms will make a profit yes. right after the announcement. I yes. So there'll be some firms, not, not all, but there'll be some firms, the firm right at the mar margin is going to enter and it's going to make a positive profit even before the trade costs go down. That's, that's the point that I wanted to make. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so now this is kind of if you want to put this back into if you, if you want to put this back into uh, um, uh, a macro model kind of just I wanted to kind of show you what aggregating and accounting looks like in um, in these types of models. One important point that I just wanted to make is in the static model, you often get this condition that if you look at total labor income kind of in a one factor world it's kind of equal to total expenditures, okay? And that this is not an aggregate accounting identity. It's kind of something that happens in equilibrium, but is not the aggregate accounting identity. So I kind of wanted to show you the accounting identity and talk a little bit too, again, about the connection with the, the macro uh, DSG type, uh, type models. Um, so in, in this dynamic version, the aggregate accounting identity is going to look like this, right? So on the expenditure side, right, you have consumption, which are kind of those expenditures, um, as well as investment by the firms, which in this model, in a single factor model, you can think of it as uh, what you're paying for the workers that cover the entry costs by the firms, right? And that is going to equal to income. Well, what is income? Um, again, it's going to be the uh, labor income, but there's also going to be the aggregate profits earned by the firms. And so this is the aggregate accounting identity, okay? What happens in the static model as well as in the sta stationary equilibrium of the dynamic model is when you impose the free entry condition, the free entry condition essentially is going to equate this and this. So this is the fixed uh, aggregate uh, entry cost paid in the economy, right? is going to reimburse the firms for the profits, these profits that they make. And so what you end up in the steady state is this equality between the two, but it's not, um, it's not that part of it is not an accounting identity. Uh, it's something that holds in steady state once you impose uh, the free entry condition. Uh, in a dynamic model, it's not gonna hold per period by period either. So they're just kind of something to be aware of, okay? The other thing I like and kind of the pair, kind of just going back to the parallel between these models and the dynamic uh, uh, DSG model is, is for the time being, there's no physical capital in this model, right? But still just by introducing entry and exit of firms, I argued kind of before that you get one huge advantage, right? That kind of over time, you can get changes in the, overall set of firms in the economy and, and even the set of firms that are choosing a particular type of activity such as exporting. But another thing it kind of generates is a natural way of thinking about uh, what, uh, about kind of uh, investment in this type of economy, right? So even though there's no capital in here, there's still investment, right? So what's happening is can, you can have in the background, there's a, a consumption saving decisions by consumers where are the savings going? The savings are going to investment, right? Kind of building up, you can think of them as new firms in my response to Gianmarco, this is kind of new blueprints for new products even at existing firms, right? Um, uh, and 
uh, and you have a cat and you have no capital, but you have a capital stock. What is a capital stock in this economy is uh, the mass of firms, right? So in this model is going to behave in terms of those kind of consumption saving dynamics and kind of the smoothing of consumption and what happens to investment and what happens to capital stock. It's going to have all of those familiar responses without even introducing uh, a physical capital, just because there is a form of investment, there is a form of capital in this economy. Uh, and so actually, when I first started working on these models and kind of pushing some of the macro ones, we kind of got pushed to say, oh, but you don't have physical capital in this model. Um, so we were kind of forced to kind of add uh, physical capital, right? The, where the physical capital is something that depreciates, it's just to kind of, you know, you're using machines to produce and the machines depreciate, so you need new capital to fix those. It didn't change any of the basic behavior of the model, right? Because the basic kind of investment dynamics are already captured here, right? And to me, it also brought up this important question, which is when we think about investment, so think about what goes into an investment in an economy, is it really the case that most of the investment is just to replace or depreciated physical machines that are producing the same types of goods? Or is it that some of it is actually going into the development of new goods, new technologies, higher quality for essentially a new good? Um, I would argue that on balance, that second one is 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 likely much larger than uh, uh, than than the first one. Although, again, in in a model with capital that doesn't have the endogenous varieties, all the investment is only for the uh, for the former. The new technology is a new kind of training for workers, for example. In in here. Yeah. Or, uh, any, or any any new good that you introduce, yes, yeah, um, yeah. And this is just kind of how to close the model, kind of get to the stationary equilibrium. There's nothing very uh, fancy here. I don't think I'm going to have time to show you kind of a growth version of this. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this if uh, uh, if I have time. So this is a very nice paper by Tom Sampson that basically takes the monopolistic competition version and puts it in, in a growth setting where there's this very strong form of knowledge spillover between entrants and, um, and incumbents. And that happens purely kind of, there's no kind of active innovation by the entrants. The entrants immediately are able to adopt kind of the technology of the um, uh, of the incumbents. And so what happens is the selection then essentially becomes an engine of growth, right? So you have a mass of firms that enter, but then uh, selection occurs and only these firms produce. And then the next time around when there are entrants, they learn from just this subset of producers, not the whole one, and so this becomes kind of the frame for the entrance, the next period. And then some of them produce, some of them don't produce, so it gets chopped again, right? And this cutoff just keeps on moving up and up and up and up and up. And it's kind of generating growth. And if you start with a Pareto distribution, right? And you just keep chopping it, you always end up with a Pareto distribution. So you get a very nice, simple, tractable form. And you just get growth because the cutoff here just keeps growing, uh, keeps growing over time. Um, this is a very strong uh, version of spillovers from entrance to uh, uh, from entrance to incumbents. Uh, you can do some welfare analysis associated with it. So, kind of one part of what this is going to say is that. Uh, the dynamic gains from trade are going to be very different from the static gains from trade, kind of right? Because if you generate more selection uh, in a static model, you're going to get uh, a certain amount of gains. But more selection is actually going to generate also these dynamic gains here. Uh, 
you do have to be kind of slightly careful here because here it's all about kind of selection generating dynamic gains. So actually you can think of something that generates more selection, but that is bad for welfare. Okay, and one example of that is a higher overhead fixed cost that generates more tougher selection, uh, but is a bad thing for welfare. And in this version, it's still going to generate a dynamic gain, right? So kind of, if you ask the policymaker what they would want to do, they would want to kind of do something that's close to kind of increasing the overhead fixed costs or really limiting the subset of firms to the most productive ones, because dynamically, you're going to gain a lot from that. So I, I don't, you can't push kind of those welfare, the, the normative analysis too far. But I think just from a positive point of view of kind of thinking about a very simple way of embedding this into a model of growth and kind of spillovers, it works kind of very nicely. That was like my three minute <laughs> overview of the paper without any equations. If you're interested, there are kind of some, some equations, you know, the, the main equations for, uh, uh, for that paper. But I kind of promised you to kind of show you some uh, uh, transition dynamics, kind of putting in that endogenous innovation decision that I started in just a fraction uh, earlier, kind of putting this into the dynamic versions that I've been talking about. So I just want to show you that and kind of what happens to to the uh, uh, what happens to the transitions. Um, so before I show that, I'm just going to show you a whole bunch of kind of basically impulse responses to trade liberalization in a world where there is either exogenous innovation, right? The alpha is fixed, is exogenous, or endogenous innovation, where the firms pick their alpha. OK, before I do that, um, I want to just kind of make a point about the response of entry to trade liberalization. So in static versions of the model, there's been a lot that's been uh, written that kind of relies on, OK, well, how does entry respond to changing the trade cost? And in, in a static version of the model, it just depends on kind of it, it ends up depending essentially on like the shape of that G distribution of firms. So there's a lot, a lot of papers that rely on the fact that if this distribution is Pareto in a static model, then when you change the trade cost, entry doesn't respond in that model. It kind of it helps you, for example, generate uh, what happens, for example, to the welfare gains from trade. For example, the, this ACR welfare formula about uh, being able to just recover exactly what the welfare gains are from a trade liberalization by just looking at the percent change in uh, the domestic uh, share of producers relies on the fact that in the background, there is this, uh, it's a static world with a Pareto distribution where nothing is happening to entry because entry is going to also kind of show up in, in, in the welfare gains. Um, but once you go to a dynamic version, there are much stronger forces that affect the, that are going to affect the entry that are much more robust than exactly what this shape of uh, the distribution is. Is exactly Pareto? Is there a little bit more weight to one side, which goes, makes entry go in one direction or in the other? I want to argue kind of in, in the dynamic version, we have a much stronger intuition about the direction of entry that has nothing to do with the shape of the distribution, okay? And to kind of make that uh, clear, I've kind of concocted this very kind of uh, simple model, actually without any firm heterogeneity or very specific kind of, uh, of heterogeneity. So think of firms as having all the same productivity, okay? The only um, difference and the only thing that, that's, that makes it heterogeneous are the, the firms enter, they all have the same size, they always still have the same size. The only element of heterogeneity is when a firm enters, I'm just going to assume that it has to wait uh, T periods before it can start exporting. So the exporters are the same as all the producers, it's just that you have to wait T periods before you can start exporting. That's the only difference between exporters and non-exporters, okay? And then I want to think about what's going to happen when I liberalize trade in this model. Oh, in this model. And to do that, I'm going to define two shares that are going to end up kind of critically de determining the response of that entry. So think about 
SX here is the aggregate share of exports in total sales. So this is in the cross section. Okay. So this is basically saying in the cross section, I have non exporters, I have exporters. How important is the share of uh, exports in total sales? This is in a CS world where remember profits are proportional to sales. So this proportionate of uh, exports to total sales. Is also going to tell me how profitable overall exporting is in the cross section in my economy. Right? So this is purely cross section. And then S tilde X is going to be from the entrance point of view and only kind of forward looking. So SX is going to be exactly that same ratio, but for an entrant, what is a net present value of its export sales relative to its total sales? Which is telling me from the point of view of an entrant, essentially how important is exporting going to be in my total profits, right? Versus this one, which is saying in the aggregate, in the economy, how important is exporting overall, okay? And so it, it turns out in this model, right? So if firms don't have to wait to export, all the firms export, right? Then these two shares have to be equal, right? Um, uh, otherwise, kind of as T increases, right? Just because of discounting, it's going to push the profitability of exporting for an entrant below what it is for the other ones, right? Because the entrant has to wait before it starts exporting. So as I make T, increase T from zero, I'm pushing this lower than this, okay? And essentially that's going to be enough to give me a negative response of entry to trade liberalization. So kind of, kind of, this is kind of an analytic result that whatever happens to entry when you liberalize trade is always gonna depend on which of those shares is more important. Like is exporting more important in the cross section or is it relatively more important for the, uh, uh, for the entrance, right? So when I liberalize trade in the example I gave, it was less important for the entrance. So the trade liberalization is disproportionately going to benefit the incumbents relative to the incumbents. Uh, the incumbent, the, it's disproportionately going to benefit the incumbents relative to the entrance. And so when you liberalize trade, it's going to lead to a drop in, uh, a, a drop in entry. And in fact, in this simple model, it's not only going, the direction is not only tied to that, you can actually show that the amount of entry is going to be proportional to this difference, right? And th so this is kind of a, an intuition about the effect of trade liberalization on entry that you know, doesn't depend on kind of very kind of specific distributions. It just says if um, exporting is more value, is uh, exporting activity is more prominent among incumbents than it is among entrants, right? Then liberalizing trade is going to lead to a negative response of entry, okay? In this very simple model, I just had it by just forcing my entrants to just wait before they start, they can start exporting. Notice that it's gonna happen very naturally in my model with like that Markov process. Even think about exogenous productivity dynamics where productivity is just evolving over time. Think of firms entering kind of with a degenerate distribution. They enter relatively small, right? Some of them grow over time and they become big enough to then uh, pay for the export costs and then start exporting. Well, it's gonna take time for an entrant, right? To be able to start exporting in that model where I'm not forcing them to just not export upon entry. And so in the model with exogenous productivity dynamics, naturally I'm generating this condition, right? That exporting is going to be a more important share of sales for the incumbents than it is going to be for the, uh, uh, for the entrance in, in expectation because of that weight. And, in, and immediately what it's going to tell me is it's going to tell me that when I liberalize trade, entry is going to drop. And it's not going to be tied to, I don't have to worry about exactly kind of what is the, 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 the shape of the distribution. It's not sensitive to that, which is the only thing that determines the response of entry in a static model. 
on uh on on entry falling when you when you liberalize trade um that's a that's a good question i don't know so a lot some of the a lot of the other things i mentioned the there was um uh uh there there was um evidence for um i don't know i i actually no i i don't, I don't know of kind of evidence for um i don't know of evidence for for that I'll have to think about that and see if that's been, been done. Yeah. Although I would, I would, I guess I say that it doesn't seem that kind of, uh, you know, kind of. Right, right, right. No, no, no. I say, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wouldn't have guessed that. I mean, my first reaction is for the West. Yeah. It would be okay in the liberalized frame. You'd expect there are now there's a bigger pie. Yeah, there's a bigger pie. Right. Yeah. But 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 the profit on export. Yes. I, I, I but but those are the ones. Yes. Yeah, but the one but but something you do see empirically, right? Like the bigger pie, the, that is kind of taken up. You see that right away. It's by the incumbents. It's not so. So, so what you do see empirically is kind of when there are kind of new export opportunities. It's not like the entrants that kind of jump in and that take it. It's the the well established incumbents, right? that that take over that so from that point of view it, it works exactly how which that part of it shows up on entry hasn't really been i i don't know of a paper that's tried to measure that yeah um so so now i'm, I'm just going to show you and yeah in the five minutes i uh uh i i have left just kind of some simulations of that and i i uh, i'm not going to kind of describe all the details i'm just so this is a version with just exogenous innovation so alpha is fixed for all the firms just to highlight that if you just permanently drop the trade cost so this is in a two country symmetric world you do get this kind of just huge drop in entry i'm not trying to make a quantitative point about it i'm just saying that these this is a prediction of the dynamic model and the intuition for why entry drops is this intuition that was giving you about uh the profitability for incumbents relative to entrance kind of uh forward looking and then essentially just to kind of highlight that um what you can do is you can kind of do a simulation of this where you know kind of that example i gave you of shrinking t to zero right well how can you do it in a dynamic model well i can set the interest rate to zero so that waiting period to become an exporter becomes less and less relevant economically speaking for uh, uh for the entrance now we didn't kill all um discounting here we should have uh because remember there's still that delta rate that kills off the big firms so that's why you see that even when we put the interest rate to zero we still get a responsive entry because there's discounting coming from the delta but if we had gotten rid of the delta which in hindsight we should have done for this by the way if you're interested this is in um uh, a chapter that I wrote with uh, Ariel Burstein that went into uh, an uh, econometric congress volume if you're kind of interested in some of the details. Um, but then this would have been perfectly flat, right? Saying, look, in that world, you liberalize entry. I mean, you, you liberalize trade. There's no responsive entry and you jump right away to the final steady state in terms of kind of final output and final consumption. And there are kind of no interesting trade liberalization dynamics in that model. But in a model where you do have this interest rate, right, then you have this weight, you know, then uh, now what you're doing is a key thing is you're making now exporting profits more valuable to the incumbents than it is in anticipation for the uh, entrance. And that's when you generate the big drop in entry. And that's going to generate kind of a lot of kind of transition dynamics uh, uh, to, uh, to trade liberalization. So now kind of let me show you just a little bit with uh, in endogenous innovation again, I, uh, so now the here the alpha is uh, is endogenous. Um, just to really highlight these comparative statics, we kind of set the elasticity for that uh, uh, endogenous response really high, like kind of quantitatively unbelievably high. So it's not about making this relevant quantitatively, it just kind of qualitatively want to go through uh, uh, some, you know, kind of some, some important things, not, 
kind of the quantitative effects. So just kind of to motivate like what's happening with entry. So there's on impact when you liberalize trade, entry drops for the reason I was just talking about before. And then kind of it kind of slowly recovers and then it starts going way back down. So what's happening is so trade is liberalized. And as I was showing you before in the static condition, right? Now it makes innovation more valuable to the exporters, right? So the exporters now increase their innovation rates. And as you see in that the thing, it's kind of constant, right? For the large exporters. So that's that first, first order condition I was showing you. So now the exporters are innovating more and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So what's happening now for an entrant that's still entering with the same size is it has to wait longer and longer before it can kind of become an exporter because it's competing against these firms that have done a lot of innovation that have gotten a lot bigger. And so that makes uh, uh, entry less and less valuable to, uh, to the entrants as these exporters are getting bigger and uh, bigger and bigger. Um, the main point that I want to make, where was the thing about uh, endogenous entry? Oh, I think I have it. Oh, I have it later. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the main points for endogenous entry. Let me just kind of mention one thing that I had already highlighted uh, about. So in this model with endogenous innovation, here is kind of the cross section of uh, innovation intensity across firms with all different kinds of productivity, right? Um, you see that it's constant, right, for these big firms. That's that first order condition that, uh, uh, that I was showing you. Um, you see that it's uh, lowest, right, for the firms that are right at that kind of exit threshold. But the main thing is, is if you ask, well, who has the highest rates of innovation, right? Those are the firms right around the uh, export threshold, right? Because these are the firms for which whether when innovation, whether innovation is successful or not, is going to de uh, determine whether they export or not. And so there's that extra kick to innovation. So this is a model that can kind of explain, well, among the new exporters, like to the right of this hump, I see uh, unusually high innovation rates. And this is something we do see in the data, as well as kind of this anticipation effect that says, well, you know, I'm not exporting yet, but I'm innovating in anticipation of becoming um, of, of becoming an exporter. Okay. Um, uh, I, I just noticed I'm right at 11. I have like, let me know, I have five minutes. I, I can pick it up after the break and then switch to the other or kind of cover that. I don't know how, what you, are, are the break times flexible? Like, can we still take the same amount of break shifted over by five minutes? Okay, so that, is, that all, is that okay? Then it'll be a clean break uh, for the one. So let me just kind of show you just a couple of things about kind of these transition dynamics and kind of endogenous innovation. Um, so now, you know, by the way, I'm solved, these models being solved, these are perfect foresight models. So I'm not putting in any kind of an aggregate uncertainty. So before I did a permanent trade liberalization, I just wanted to show that the permanence of trade liberalization, now that we have these kinds of dynamic models, are going to be very important. So here's a counter scenario where trade drops in the same way, but the firms kind of know that it's the trade liberalization isn't going to last. You know, a, a four model would just have this kind of stochastically potentially revert. Here, the firms know for sure that it's going to revert back. What you can show here is then the impact of endogenous innovation, which is why we set it so high in the baseline, is massively muted when firms don't perceive that innovation to be permanent, right? Because the only reason they're innovating is kind of, well, I want to get, uh, I want to keep getting kind of, um, I'm innovating and this is going to be a slow process. I'm slowly going to kind of become bigger over time because in the new, uh, economy with lower trade costs, I have this advantage of, of being bigger. But if I know that that's not going to last for very long, right, innovation is forward looking and it's just not going to even immediately on impact when the trade costs are the same, it's just not going to respond by very much. So kind of, I think that it's something that's important empirically that says when you look at something like, for example, innovation responses to trade liberalization, 
that the permanence of that trade liberalization is going to be um, is going to be very important, right? This is why kind of and it, it, it's happened also in the in, in the reverse kind of with kind of the Trump tariff disruptions that uncertainty can be particularly disruptive because these innovation decisions are kind of are, are forward looking. So you increase the uncertainty to the firms and you can massively affect these innovation responses. But the, it, it all, if it's temporary, it all depends how long it lasts. I mean, if, if, if it's temporary that lasts a long time, then- Yes, I, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But, but the, the point I'm making is that these factors matter, right? It's not, you don't wanna say, well, how much innovation am I going to get by dropping my tariffs three and a half percent, right? Yeah. Because the firms, if, if you're talking about an innovation response, what you really wanna know is exactly what you're saying. Like, well, what does this look like and how much weight am I putting on this versus this or it going up later in the future? So that's, that's the basic point that I wanna make. It's not necessarily about the drop here. So kind of, you know, empirically the quick thing is to do, oh, I measure the drop here, what happens to innovation, right? But our models tell us, well, you know what happens to innovation? It's not just dependent on this drop, it depends on this whole path. That's the main point that uh, uh, that's the main point that I want to make. And actually kind of showing that when trade liberalization is not permanent, that actually the endogenous innovation, even with that huge in elasticity, doesn't look very different than the exogenous innovation case. Um, the last I'll, I'll stop here, just kind of anticipation effects. So now I'm going to do the reverse. So trade costs are going to go down in the future, right? Uh, on announcement, when uh, innovation is endogenous, same, so this is kind of the same thing in reverse, I can get the increase in innovation upon announcement well ahead of the trade costs going down, right? So this is a different channel than the option value channel that I was describing before. This is basically saying, oh, same, same amount of reasoning. I know that trade is, going to, trade is going to be liberalized in the future, so there's this benefit to kind of being bigger in the future, innovation takes a while to unfold. I have an incentive to start innovation, uh, innovating now. So again, this idea that you know, if you want to relate kind of innovation responses to trade, right? That kind of correlating these two is kind of missing something important, which is that what the firms kind of really care about is kind of that that whole future uh, uh, future path. Having said that, I'm also very just as guilty of kind of doing empirical work, looking at innovation responses to current levels of uh, of, uh, of trade regimes. Um, and I'll stop. That those are the kind of main points I wanted to make with that model. So that's kind of for the monopolistic competition one, and then I'll talk more about kind of thinking about this in a growth model, or talking about Arrow and Schumpeter forces for innovation and. Uh, and escape competition after after the break. So and and I and I owe you that that five minutes that I just took that I just took now. No, I didn't. I never thought about that empirical question. <laughs> it's good to go to keep kind of presenting that. You know, for me it was something. Oh, this is not good. What's the electric market? There's a lot of empirical evidence on a lot of things, but that one. You know, there's no evidence. That's true. That's true. That's true. To enter the export market, yes. right? But it's not, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I know there's been a lot of work about like the spatial distribution of exporters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, well, oh, no, I just wanted to use the, 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 the,
I don't know of some that are specific to both of that. I know there's been some, I've seen some pictures in China that kind of shows like the distribution of kind of labor movement kind of to, to the shore and stuff, uh, the coast. Um, uh, yeah, so there's been that kind of stuff, but you're thinking more specifically kind of with innovation spillovers too. Right, as well, right? No, so I, I don't think I've seen something. I mean, it kind of, yeah. you know, would, would make sense. But I mean, we, there are separate ones with, with these innovation clusters. Right? Sure. It has, it has to be an important story, right? I mean, right, for you sure. Know, right. Where, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of where. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you know, you know, I don't think it's a good thing. So much biotech. Right. Yeah, yeah. But how kind of that can be generated to by trade, because trade is obviously connected to I haven't seen anything. Okay, so I'll take the bad coffee now and then, and then, and then, then you'll show me the, the good yes, one sure. after lunch. Okay, it's the deal, man. He's the one. Oh, I'm the one. It's, 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 uh, it's, <laughs> so, another like, question.